Yes, uh, hello everybody and uh, welcome back um, for our next presentation. Um, I have uh, the pleasure to introduce uh, to you Professor Dominic Wujastik, who uh, is professor at uh, uni the University of Alberta um, in Edmonton, Canada. There uh, he holds uh, the Sigma chair in classical Indian society and policy and is also a professor at the Department of uh, History and uh, Classics. Um, Dominic <coughs> has uh, worked on uh, Vyakarana, on, uh, uh, on grammar, on Sanskrit grammar. Uh, he has an extensive uh, research uh, and publication record on Indian uh, manuscripts, uh, paleography, um, and uh, he is uh, an internationally uh, renowned uh, specialist on uh, Ayurveda, on Indian medicine, and he has published uh, widely on yoga. And uh, this is uh, the inter uh, section, uh, yoga and Ayurveda, um, that uh, his uh, talk today will uh, deal with, uh, which is entitled uh, The Path to Liberation Through Introversion, Nibriti in uh, Early Ayurveda. Welcome, Dominic. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind invitation. Right. Um, uh, I'll share the screen. I hope that's worked. Can everybody see my slide there? Fine. Great, great. Okay. Um, so I did write a little while ago about um, one passage in the uh, Charaka Sanghita, in the uh, classic of of. Ayurvedic medicine um, uh, about um, about the uh, about a, a very interesting passage that um, presents a completely new picture of or different and un unexpected picture of yoga. It's a small section at the end of the I think the first chapter of the section on the human body um, in the in the Charaka text um, and. Um, and and it curiously it it will it, it does two things it, um, it this is a treatise that is from probably a couple of hundred years at least before patanjali so we're looking at yoga before it was formalized uh, by patanjali for the brahmin audience um, and it, it gives an eightfold path of yoga but those eight eight steps are nothing at all like the ashtanga yoga that we're used to so that was interesting, and they're they're a little hard to understand. They're kind of somewhat intellectual, but the overall goal of Charaka's yoga in that passage is to develop um, smriti or memory. And he talks about, um, or the the text talks about memory in in the sense of um, mindfulness, but also very clearly also in the sense of just remembering like as in remembering what you learned, remembering what happened yesterday. So in Sanskrit, this word smriti has these two rather different, well, what for us are two different meanings, but for the ancient Sanskrit authors were really all just part and parcel of the same thing, which is, which is to, uh, that remembering was both uh, recalling the past, but also recalling the present. Um, so yes, so that is the, the the medical path of yoga is about the establishment of uh, smriti and and uh, indeed the expression uh, that we are very familiar with from um, from Buddhist modern Buddhist practice satipatthana is in the Sanskrit version is used also in the in the medical treatise smriti upasthana. Um, so today, what I wanted to do was to look at a slightly different passage that takes a different approach that is also in the section on the body um, and uh, uses these two key terms from early Indian philosophy, pravriti, turning outwards, and nivriti, turning inwards. Um, so I also, before really going any further, I just want to um, pay uh, tribute to the work of Greg Bailey, who has, uh, for most of his career on and off, uh, his very productive career, which is still going strong, he's been writing about Pravriti Nirviti. I, the, I didn't put in the dates here. They're all in the, in the bibliography at the back of this paper. But his first paper, um, the, the materials one at the top of the list there, uh, was published in 1985. 
and the latest one, the preliminary notes at the end, is still in press. So he's been he's been revisiting this, and indeed had a, a research project at his university on on this whole um, concept of property nivriti. And I think he has done more than anyone else to excavate these concepts as an important and recurring theme in Indian uh, philosophical and religious thought. I'm, I'm saying this about Greg. Uh, I mean, partly for the reasons I've given that he's done a lot, but also I have this strong sense that I'm I'm a bit of a poacher, that I, I'm talking about something that's really his domain and uh, sort of pushing in with this with this topic. But really, I'm 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 just trying to contribute to to what Greg has done. Um, so, what what is this text that we're looking at? The Charaka Samhita, which means the compendium of somebody called Charaka, was composed over a longish period between perhaps 200 BC and 200 AD. We're, we're rather vague about this, and and for good reasons, because the treatise itself, at, at, in every single chapter, says this treatise is Charaka's rewriting or Charaka's editing of the treatise of someone else called Agnivesha. And then towards the end of the book, the treatise says this is somebody else, this is Dridabala's rewriting on and completion of the treatise of Charaka, which is a completion, which is a rewriting of the treatise of Agnivesha. So it, 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 the treatise itself declares itself to be the work of many hands, many editors, many authors over many years. And it becomes clear when you read it, uh, that it sort of comes in and out of focus, and there are there are different voices. You can you can tell that it's uh, saying different things at different times. It's not it's not hugely consistent as a treatise, and I think that we see that in the present case as well. Um, the section on the body, um, uh, the sharira sthana. So sharira is a, an adjectival derivative meaning um, what pertains to the body, what has to do with the body. So it, it's uh, it's the section on what what pertains to the body, and um, it, it um, consists of eight chapters, and it's located between the earlier uh, part of the work, which is called the section on special knowledge, the vimanasthana, and the later section on the senses, the indriyasthana. The context, I think, here isn't hugely important but anyway let me let me just sort of give it to you anyway the the former section describes topics such as the logical logic of medical debate while the latter section describes topics such as the signs of impending death the section on that what pertains to the body um, opens with a chapter on the self and its body it describes various mental and physical components of the human body and their relationship to the timeless uh, objective inner witness, the Atman. With, within this scheme, the chapter explores the causes of disease and ends with a short but original section about the nature of yoga as the pathway to liberation, this, the passage I mentioned earlier. Chapter two addresses issues of procreation, transmigration and heredity. Chapter three continues the theme of embryology and the metaphysical causes and conditions of birth. Chapter four is a detailed description of the physical development of the embryo month by month through gestation, the causes of abnormal birth and a typology of personality types. So the chapter that we're discussing today, chapter five, calls itself the chapter on research into the purusha. So this familiar word, often translated as person, has at least two meanings in Charaka's compendium. It can mean quite physically the human body, but in other passages it means the inner self, the ultimate witness, and it's synonymous with the word Atman. So one has to judge from the context what the author is talking about. In our chapter, the author begins by drawing homologies between the constituents of the physical universe and the constituents of the human body. This is um, 
the 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 nearest passage I've found uh, that that really does the the macrocosm microcosm thing. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about. You know, it's a very popular idea in contemporary thought, the idea about the parallels between the macrocosm and the microcosm, although often it's not unpacked in detail. But uh, in this in this chapter of the of, of the Charaka Sanghita, the author really goes into this and makes also makes this an important component of liberation, of, of the insights that lead to liberation. So, for example, he says, light in the world is parallel to knowledge in the individual. Darkness in the world is parallel to ignorance in the individual. And so on. And the purpose of becoming aware of these parallels between the individual person and the world at large is to engender a sense of true knowledge and an awareness of the uniqueness of the inner self as the cause of happiness and misery. No, which, which is it's an odd thing to say uh, if one thinks about the doctrines of Vedanta. Knowing that the world and the individual person mirror each other also reveals that turning outwards, pravritti, one of our key terms today, is the cause of the world and the cause of human misery. While disengagement or nivriti, turning inwards, leads to their cessation, their uparama. The student, Agnivesha, if you remember the original author, um, he's, he's the author, you know, the original author whom Charaka is, is uh, editing, but also appears in the treatise as a character. So he asks for more details on this topic, and that is what we shall explore today. But just to complete the survey of, of the context, the outer context, um, after our chapter, chapter five, the author turns again to the maintenance of the physical body in chapter six, to the parts of the body in chapter seven, and to procreation, the pregnant mother, and childbirth, uh, and the care of the newborn in the last chapter. So that, that's the overall context. It, the, the, the treatise actually seems to veer interestingly between very concrete information about, um, about uh, procreation, uh, embryology, which is very detailed. And in, in, in a sort of medical anatomical sense, it's quite extraordinary. Obviously, these doctors had the opportunity to examine many embryos at different terms and moments in, in, in development. And, uh, and then it, it becomes very philosophical in other passages. So um, I just wanted to, uh, as, as Karen did in her previous talk, I just wanted to um, just mention what is the relationship between what we're looking at and Patanjali. Um, our text is earlier than Patanjali, so the, the Yoga Sutra didn't exist at the time this material was put together. Um, what is I find quite interesting uh, that, that is that the, um, the concept the concepts of pravritti nivritti were theorized as a, as a, as a pair of philosophical concepts very early and I mean as Greg has shown Greg Bailey you know it's in the Mahabharata you can also find passages in the Pali Canon and so forth so this is not a new set, new set of theorized terms but Patanjali really doesn't use them in that way at all the two words pravritti nivritti do occur several times in his uh, sutras in uh, I've got a list of them here it's not I did I put that in a slide? No, uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if anyone wants them, I can give them. But but he really just means the ordinary language use of the terms. Uh, now, Philip can correct me if you know, or anyone who's very familiar with the Patanjali Yoga Shastra can correct me if I'm wrong about this. And I haven't examined all the passages in the Bhashya portion of the of the uh, Yoga Shastra, but um, definitely in the sutras, pravritti just means beginning, starting, going forth, or something like that, and nivritti for stopping. Um, so they're not, and, and they're not put as a pair representing contrasting styles of life. So I found that quite interesting. So um, Agnivesha 
now, from now, in the rest of the paper, we'll be simply looking at what the treaty says. So it begins with Agnivesha asking, what is this turning outwards? What is it rooted in, O oh Lord? He's speaking to his teacher. And what is the means for disengagement, for Nivriti turning back? So the Lord said, turning outwards is rooted in delusion, desire, hatred, and karma. From that turning outwards comes, um, I haven't tried, I've given you this on the, on the uh, slide, from that turning outwards comes ego, ahankara, clinging, uncertainty, immersion, attachment, and so forth, a number of vices, and we'll, we'll look at these uh, individually. So he lists, he lists, however, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven particular problems that are the causes of this engagement, this outward turning of the mind. And then there's a very nice, uh, there's a very nice metaphor, a, a very nice simile here. After spreading over a person, so to speak, they, these vices stand over him like trees with great broad branches, overcoming a little tree. One who is overwhelmed by these cannot overcome existence. So what are these problems? What are these? Uh, so the structure of the text is that it lays out all the difficulties, all the causes, the root causes of pravriti, and then it turns to how you turn back, how you disengage from the world and achieve moksha. So the first of them is ego or ahankara. So this is a technical term from Sankhya philosophy, but it really does seem here in this passage, and again, I would love to discuss this perhaps with, with Philip and others, uh, it does actually seem to mean ego in a bad sense, you know, sort of selfishness, the, 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 the small ego, the sense that we would use, you know, Freudian sense of the word ego maybe. And uh, the text actually explains and gives examples of what it means. So, we, you know, we, we don't have to guess too much. It's not just a technical term that's thrown to us in, in the abstract. Um, Ahankara is saying, quotes, I am well endowed with such and such a caste, such and such appearance, wealth, livelihood, intelligence, conduct, knowledge, ancestry, youth, strength, and ability. So th that is what our author means by ahankara. And having that point, having that attitude is part of what leads you to engage further in the world. The second is clinging. And he says, this is an action of the mind, speech, or body that is not aimed at liberation, at apavarga. So that's somewhat generic. Saushaya, uncertainty, means asking, quotes, do the following items exist or not? That is, the results of karma, entitlement, liberation, the person, existence after death. So if you are in doubt about existence after death, if you are in doubt about whether there really is such a thing as the results of karma, that would count as sangshaya, uncertainty, and it would also be something that would bind you to this world. Immersion, abhisamplava, is believing that, and when I explain these terms, I'm, I'm literally translating what the author says, there is nothing other than myself in all conditions. I am the creator. I am perfect by nature. I am the aggregate of a particular body, senses, intellect, and memory. It's almost like the Christian sin of pride. It's a little different, but uh, it's it's a, also somewhat like ego at the beginning, this immersion. But it, it's um, being strongly identified with your own embodiment and your own um, excellence. Abhyavapata, I've translated as, well, or here in the slide as attachment. Later on, I changed my translation to gregariousness. Um, I, I don't, uh, yeah, we, one could discuss this. But anyway, here is the explanation uh, This in, in, in sentences. Uh, it's the idea, quotes, I own the group that consists of my mother, father, 
brother, wife, descendants, relations, and friends. And I belong, and that group owns me, or I belong to that group. So Abhyavapata is, is your social embeddedness. It's your sense that your family is yours and you are your families or your societies. The next one, contrariness, is um, vipratyaya, is having, quote, upside down convictions about what should or should not be done, about what is good and what is bad, and about what is pure and what is impure. This idea of contrariness actually crops up at other places in the in the, this medical treatise in a, in a much more medical context uh, that you can do yourself damage by by make, get, making wrong judgments about what is good for you and what is bad for you. Avishesha is a lack of discrimination. Uh, I've translated it as, I mean, mainly, but I've translated, it's not quite what the word means, but um, uh, uh, I've translated that way because of the way it's explained. The explanation says, this is holding non-specific views about the knower and what is not the knower, about substance, that is uh, translating prakriti, and its modifications, and outwardness, pravriti, and disengagement, nivriti. So, avishesha, there's not quite discrimination. I think I, perhaps I'm wrong there. It's more like not, not being precise, not going into the details, not having a firm grasp of the details of various important philosophical points of view. And the last one is Anupaya. This I find really fascinating and it came as a great surprise to me uh, when, I, when I came across it. Um, let me just close down. I just want to keep a close eye on the time. I've got a clock over there. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what our author says about inappropriate methods, Anupaya. They are described as undertakings like sprinkling holy water, prokshana, fasting, the fire ritual, daily ablutions, that's uh, washing yourself three times a day, consecration, ab abhyukshana, invocation, ahavan, avahana, performing rituals for others, yajana, and rituals for oneself, yajana, petitioning or praying, yajana, and entering into water and fire. That's fascinating, and I'm not quite sure what that last one means. I immediately think about the ceremonies of walking on hot coals uh, for entering into fire, but I, I could be completely wrong about that. Uh, and, and we just don't know what he exactly meant by entering into fire and water. Um, but the, these are major religious rituals. These are established religion, all of these things, the consecrations, the praying, especially uh, yajana and yajana, performing uh, formal uh, rituals, this is all uh, rejecting the normal religious life, that all of the things that a religious practitioner would do are here categorized as being part of the the problem, part of pravriti, part of an external engagement in, in the external world, something that prevents you achieving moksha. So then he says, uh, thus a person who has no intelligence, no dhi, no determination, dhriti, or mindfulness, smriti, who is identified with their ego and who is attached full of uncertainty, whose mind is immersed, who is gregarious and holds contrary views, who holds no particular detailed opinion, and who is on the wrong path or has the wrong means, is a hospitable tree for all the suffering that is rooted in defects of the mind and body. In this way, a person is muddled about the defects of ego and the rest and cannot overcome pravriti, outwardness, and that is the root of evil, agha. So disengagement, nivriti, is freedom, 
And liberation is that highest peace, that unchanging one, that Brahma. And then he tells us how this is achieved. And this is a very interesting and very long list. It's a sort of long bulleted list of things one must do. I don't know, there's 20 or 30 of them, and I'm not going to try and go through them all with you. I'm just going to select some of them. Um, what they all amount to is to become a monk. That's basically it. You have to become um, a monk, a sannyasin, give up the world. And some of this is, uh, uh, well, we'll see. I'll look at some of them with you. So first of all, in his long list of, of activities and, and things that one must embrace in order to, to achieve nivriti, turning inwards, is to find a teacher and to follow his teaching and to serve good people, avoiding those who are bad and, sorry, yeah, avoiding those who are not good and not congregating with bad people. Um, pariksha, having, having checked, having looked around, I translate it as circumspectly, <laughs> speak the truth that is good for all beings and that is not rough and not untimely. Attend to all living beings as if they were oneself. This is, I think, a gesture, an Im implicit, a tacit gesture to the idea of the parallel between oneself and the world. Bind, so this is interesting, bind the body for meditation. So the, the word for meditation here is dhyana. So this to me suggests the use of a yoga patra, uh, but I'm not absolutely sure. I mean, it could be, you know, it, it, the word is bandha for binding. So I think it's a yoga patra, but one could take it metaphorically as a sort of, you know, being strong for meditation. But it's also very interesting that the word here is dhyana. So it's very clearly meditation in the, in the very classic sense. Um, the next term I, I selected from this long list was this undertaking to sleep, stand, move, watch, eat, sport, vihara, sport, uh, move the limbs and so, so on, uh, pratyanga cheshta, with mindfulness, smriti purvika. So uh, this, you know, I'm always interested in how the word smriti is, is being intended by these authors. So I don't think you could say that you're standing, moving, watching while remembering what you had for breakfast yesterday. I suppose you could be trying to remember, for example, a religious text. Perhaps you've memorized the Bhagavad Gita so that you're using, trying to remember the Gita, remember the verses as you move around the, in your daily activities. Um, but uh, uh, honestly, I think the, the expression Smriti Purvika means probably remembering yourself in the present moment. So being present and mindful while you conduct yourself. Interesting idea of trying to do that while you're asleep. Um, so again, uh, this to me is, is I, I was going to say it's a, it's a, it reminds me of Buddhist practice. This is, it's in the Buddhist literature of, of, of the works that, that Karen was talking about and other uh, the, the works in the Pali Canon that where the, the, this whole question of, of Smriti Sati in Pali is, is discussed. And I'm, I'm used to thinking about this as something that's discussed in the context of Buddhism. But of course, I think it was a more general concept in early society. And uh, uh, it, it needn't be a hard, a hard sort of sectarian marker. I don't think this means, you know, Charaka was a Buddhist. I think he was living in a world where these concepts circulated quite freely. Being aware of the sameness of the creation, the loka, of the world, I mean, sorry, the creation of the world, the loka, and the human being, the purusha. So this parallelism here is invoked again. He's talked about it a lot in, in detail earlier in the chapter, but here he brings it up as one of the factors, again, that leads towards uh, introversion or turning inwards. 
and uh, just managed to pack a few more. <laughs> Sorry, this slide is rather full. Um, are there, is the bottom line visible to you uh, where it says, yeah, liberation on the, at the bottom? So um, be afraid of missing the right moment for action. I, I, I rather like that. Always be positive about starting yoga. That's also interesting conceptually, but also it gives us the word yoga in this passage. So we've had certain key words. We've had dhyana, or binding yourself for meditation, for dhyana. We've had mindfulness, smriti purvika, purvika, in your daily activities. And now we've got being positive about yoga arambha, about taking up or beginning yoga. Be strong-minded and kindle the strength of intelligence, will, and memory for the sake of liberation. There's quite a lot more, um, and a lot of it is to do with what's in English, in English terminology I might call girding your loins. That is to say, um, being determined, being strong, not giving in to mental weakness, depression, laziness. So it's like a, a sort of um, a call to a call to en energetic engagement with the religious life. There's also uh, a little bit about how, you know, sort of fairly ordinary stuff about how you should carry around a sewing kit so that you can mend your own clothes, um, carry a water pot so that you can have some water to wash yourself, um, about never, never allow yourself to think of women. <laughs> this is all somewhat, I find slightly disappointing or, or at least, you know, one-sided one-sided material aimed at the male sannyasin, at the male um, renunciant practitioner. Um, but fair enough, you know, if that's who it's aimed at, that's who it's aimed at. But this text, at least parts of it are not aimed at everybody. They're not aimed at women. Um, giving up your possessions, having a piece of cloth to cover your nakedness, Wearing orange and red robes, the color of ochre, um, and holding a staff and a begging bowl. So it's very, very, very clearly directed at the renunciant wandering mendicant. And this is the person who is on the path of turning inwards. So at the end of the chapter, there are some actually rather beautiful, slightly difficult, but beautiful verses summing up what this is like um, and, and what happens at the end of this process. A stained mind is purified by these purifying means or methods, like a mirror being wiped with oil, cloth, and brush. The true realization that evolves from a purified mind breaks through that very strong darkness that is formed out of great delusion, Mahamoha. It causes one to know the it, that is the true realization, causes one to know the nature of all beings without appetence, you know, without craving. It causes one to succeed in yoga. And again, here we have this key term. And to achieve Sankhya. That, that, that's, that's for Philip. <laughs> I hope that Philip might, might respond to that and and think about it. it. It's interesting to succeed in yoga and to achieve sampat is, is the verb, to achieve sankhya. It, that is the true realization. And the word realization here is buddhi. That's the word I'm translating. So, you know, we often think of it as an organ of the mind. I think in the context, it has to be this breakthrough realization. It causes one Number 18, causes one not to become ego, not to serve the cause. That's very odd. Not to serve the cause, the karana. Not to depend on anything and to renounce everything. It, that true realization, causes one to go permanently to the immortal, peaceful, unchanging absolute. That realization is what has traditionally been called knowledge, success, principle, intelligence and wisdom. So that is, that is essentially the end of my presentation of this material. 
And I just wanted to uh, just to end on a on a slightly personal note. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I remember um, that I got myself a copy of Limaye and Vadeka's classic uh, edition of the Upanishads. It was published in 1958, and I remember staring at the covering page because it was so odd. What they had done here was to reproduce a. I'm sorry, my my image here is really really bad. Uh, it's not very good even in the original book, but um, but this is even worse. I, you can just about see these are the sort of wings of two birds. And they'd copied this image and put it on their title page from a, proto, a book on proto-Bulgarian artwork by this uh, Geza Feher, Les Monuments de la Culture Proto-Bulgare. And what they felt they were doing by this must have been to say that there is an old Indo-European theme about engagement with the world or withdrawal from the world. And they've quoted in Sanskrit underneath here, the Rig Veda um, 164, which is the famous riddle hymn, which says two birds, companions and friends, nestle on the very same tree and one of them eats a tasty fig and the other not eating looks on. So the riddle hymn, Rig Veda 1164, is, is a riddle. It, it's full of all sorts of interesting things, suggestions, and, and um, as Brereton and Jameson, the recent translators of the Rig Veda, say, most of these riddles we just can't solve anymore. It's too much time has passed, too much knowledge has been lost, and we, we understand that some of them are quite suggestive and may point in certain directions. A lot of this very long hymn uh, is still just mysterious to us. But this passage has been repeated in, the, in several of the Upanishads, the Shweta, Shwatara, and the Mundaka, uh, word for word, verbatim. So it was obviously uh, something that caught, the, caught people's attention in the ancient world as being important. And its interpretation later becomes the same as this idea of pravriti nivriti, that is that, that some people engage with the world and get caught up in activities and outward turned um, awareness, the senses, and others turn back. So some people eat the fruit, some people eat the sweet fig, uh, the tasty fig, and other people just watch. And those who just watch are on the path of nivriti, of turning back. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's all I have to offer today. Um, and uh, I look forward to any questions on conversation. Thank you, Philip, for inviting me to join in today's proceedings. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for um, introducing uh, into our uh, online conference uh, the, the aspect of uh, yeah, yoga-like uh, practices uh, occurring in, in Ayurveda, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, something that is also uh, understudied um, frequently and an uh, uh, interesting um, aspect uh, of uh, Indological uh, scholarship that needs to be uh, taken into uh, consideration when one wants to um, get a fuller view of the historical developments uh, of, of yoga. And uh, as you correctly said, th these are uh, among the earliest uh, materials that we have um, from the perspective uh, of Brahmanism. At least there is some, uh, um, uh, um, how should I say, integration of uh, uh, um, Brahmanic thought in, in Ayurveda and the attempt uh, from Ayurveda practitioners to uh, be accepted um, in, in the cultural milieu of, uh, of Brahmanism. So, um, yeah, to, I would say together with the Mahabharata, these are the earliest uh, um, clear uh, evidence uh, that, that we have. Yeah, so, so you posed a couple of uh, questions uh, to me, uh, um, assuming uh, or attaining a, a, a Sankhya, I would interpret this as a uh, um, um, Knowledge of the of the re reality, a, a vision, an all-embracing uh, um, yeah knowledge. Uh, so maybe um, 
in, in the lines with the uh, publication by uh, Franklin Edgerton on the meaning of Sankhya and uh, yoga in the Mahabharata, uh, who argued that uh, yoga frequently means uh, uh, method and uh, Sankhya can then mean a theoretical knowledge on which uh, uh, the methods uh, may be based. So that, that would be an idea maybe to interpret this. And then uh, I would have a, a brief remark on, um, uh, um, on, on uh, binding the body for uh, dhyana, for meditation. Um, we, we both have uh, worked uh, a little bit on uh, early asanas uh, together. And uh, the work that is used there frequently for assuming an asana is a bant. So uh, I could imagine that uh, uh, binding the, mud, uh, the body for, uh, for dhyana uh, might mean uh, assuming uh, a suitable uh, uh, physical position, uh, an asana uh, for for meditation. You know that that would be my um, uh, idea in in this uh, regard. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. Yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah. One brief rem remark on ahankara. I think we also have this in Patanjali Yoga that we have uh, um, the same word used for two different things. Uh, sometimes um, uh, for uh, klesha, uh, like asmita, that is egoity, and then uh, it may also appear sometimes uh, as a cosmological principle in the process uh, of uh, uh, in emergence of, uh, um, of Pakriti um, into, the, into the world. So yeah, these are uh, my remarks, and uh, yeah, now I would like to... Um, um, open the floor for questions, and I see that uh, Shaman uh, Hadley is the first one uh, who would like to uh, comment or uh, ask a question. Please, Shaman. Thank you. That was a wonderful paper. I have two uh, sh questions, probably brief. Uh, first is just informational. Is it correct that um, neither Charaka nor Sushrutta uh, contain passages on pranayama? Yes, uh, as far as that's correct. Yes, as far as I know. I mean, prana is discussed quite a lot. It's not, a, it's not the most prominent feature. It's not, uh, but, but the, the idea that there are five breaths and so on is definitely present in, the, in, the, in these two treatises, but not as far as I'm aware. And, you know, breathing in and out is mentioned occasionally, but, but not, not the yogic practice of pranayama. As far as I know, I'm you know it's uh, it's like saying uh, you know like saying something is not mentioned in the Mahabharata. There's so much of it, and you know I, I feel a bit inadequate that I haven't actually read every single sentence in the original Sanskrit and thought about it all. So I might be missing something, but not to my knowledge. Okay, uh, and the second question is whether in in Charaka we have um, descriptions about the actual techniques involved in dhyana. No, 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 uh, not beyond the material that I published in 2012 about, about uh, Smriti Upasthana. <clears throat> um, but no, no, dhyana is, the word is just dropped in there as, as, a, as a term, but without it being unpacked. You know, we have, obviously we have later commentators, but our early, the earliest sort of well-known commentator is Chakrapani, who is already almost a thousand years later uh, and uh, so his his interpretations are what people thought in Bengal in you know in the eleventh century, uh, which is evidence for Bengal in the eleventh century, but it's not evidence really for what Charaka thought. Thank you. And and Chakrapani doesn't doesn't go into the what what he thinks dhyana is. He he, he basically his general general picture of what the commentators of Chakra says here is that is that everything good is is something that tends towards moksha. Are there further uh, questions or um, Anisha, do we have something uh, in the chat? Uh, that, uh, quite a lot in the chat. <laughs> um, the last one's from Alexander. Uh, Dominic, are these two are these two paths, eightfold you talked uh, in the beginning of your talk and poverty, nivriti, reconciled on the text, or are these uh, just two independent approaches to the same goal? They, are, they seem to be two independent approaches. They are not reconciled, and they. Are, this is very subjective, but they read to me like written by different people or coming from a different place, different, different they don't sound like part of the same narrative. 
I think I, I take, although they are all in the Shari Rastana, I, I, t I personally, but I haven't got strong evidence for this, but you know, when you read, you read a lot of this material, you, you sort of, you, it's a bit like being a wine taster, you know, you get a nose. <laughs> and uh, maybe one could do some statistics on the vocabulary or something. But to me, they read like, like two different um, ways of thinking about this issue of moksha. One, the, the earlier one is much more Buddhist in its general flavor. Uh, and this one is much more to do with renunciation. And actually something I've been thinking, having, having just f looked at all of this, I'm going to send it all to my, uh, our friend uh, Patrick Olivelle, and just who's a great expert in the literature on, on renunciation and ask him if this um, matches up. I'm sure it does, but you know what, what he thinks of it, what's his reaction to seeing this long list of bulleted points which essentially describe the life of a sannyasin or the commitments of a sannyasin and whether he would immediately say, oh yeah, no, that's exactly what you know, the Yatidharma Prakasha says or something like that. I'll be interested in his reaction. Yeah, so, uh, the, okay. Yeah, the next uh, question would be from Vida Moti, or did you want to, to add something? I just wanted to respond to Suzanne Price, who I see also okay. said, is there no similar rule for women in this case? Not in this text. No, it shows no, uh, no um, awareness of nuns or female ascetics. Um, I'm sure they existed at the time, but uh, they are not, there's no rule given for them uh, that's different. Thank so. you. <laughs> yeah, which is not so much uh, a surprise uh, considering that the medical practitioners were also all male. Uh, in, uh, mm. yeah. So no midwives or anything like that in N such no, the, Yes, no, there, were, there were midwives, but the text says um, this is what the midwives say. I mean, it's okay. not. It, it's not that quite explicit, but it's not the midwives writing the literature. It, it's the yeah, doctors saying what the midwives say. There's a, actually a really insightful article about this by Martha Selby, who, um, as it were, reads between the lines. And um, uh, uh, I've actually got a reference somewhere here. Um, anyway, if you, I'm, I'm sorry. But I if will you research, up, don't worry, I will research. And, and if you can't find it, come back to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, <easily>. but uh, <laughs> even if I'm not expert in the field, there are certain things which you can find nowadays quite easily. I've, I've actually got it. It's in the journal Asian Medicine uh, the, and of 2005. Uh, Asian medicine, I think the subtitle of the journal was Tradition and Modernity or some Tradition and Practice. Uh, anyway, and um, the article is called Narratives of Conception, Gestation and Labor in Sanskrit Ayurvedic Texts. Thanks a lot. I, it's I a will pleasure. definitely look that up. <laughs> Great. I'm very grateful for that. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, now, yeah, uh, please, Vida Murti. Oh. Yeah, uh, Dominic, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, and uh, that's very uh, fam I'm uh, familiar with this kind of uh, uh, talk. And um, what would you say? It remembers me of the Bhagavad Gita, for example, so the value of values in chapter 13. Yes. Uh, and uh, what about the, 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 the timing? Is it uh, the same time when Charaka uh, wrote it and uh, the Mahabharata? Can you uh, tell me something mm -hmm. about the, the, the relation of these uh, texts and authors? So I'm not an expert in epic studies. My understanding, and, and you know, if any, it's e it's easily possible that other people at this meeting know more than me about this. But my un best understanding is that the epic, in the form in which we have it today, was probably assembled in the period exactly the same time period between about 200 BC and 200 AD, or BCE and CE, and. Um, also that the Bhagavad Gita may always have had a slightly separate life and have been maybe a separate treatise that got got inserted into the epic at a certain point. But again, I, I don't know the, the chronology and, and the latest scholarship on that. However, yes, um, so 
so there's a, <laughs> I remember a friend of mine, Jim Benson, used to joke. He said, oh, everything that matters, you know, it's just like everybody says it's between 100 BC and 100 AD. And there's some truth in that. There's an awful lot of material that seems to have crystallized in the Indian Sanskrit tradition in that period, roughly, you know, just before and after the time of Christ. And I have, in recent years, I've begun to think that this is connected with the invention of writing. And writing, um, and uh, again, I, uh, this is subjective, but writing, uh, there is good evidence and very strong arguments that I find compelling that writing for India was invented by King Ashoka uh, in the context of him writing his treatises, his texts, his edicts on rock. So he wanted to do what Darius I had done in Persia a few hundred years earlier, and he needed to be able to write down Prakrit, and so he invented an alphabet. There were some precursors that he used. It wasn't coming out of a vacuum, but he basically used Mid Middle Eastern or Persian and Middle Eastern models of what the alphabet was. He created an alphabet for Prakrit, and, and used it to write these inscriptions, which were basically an ancient system of blog posting. <laughs> and so after some time, we begin to find this transformation of culture in India and the creation of one work after another that says, this work is a condensation of a, a much bigger work of 100,000, 100 million shlokas that uh, all we can give you now is 10,000 shlokas. Uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, this kind of idea that there was a much bigger past and it's being condensed now into this little work. And then you get works like Charaka that say, well, this is somebody's teaching to somebody and I'm just re-editing it and so forth. And, and I wonder if these are not all signs that, that the knowledge systems of ancient India are being written down for the first time. They're appearing in a new medium. Um, and that this brings with it great advantages, but also great problems. And maybe for a lot of authors, a sense of loss, a sense that something much bigger has been lost, this, this long tradition of purely remembered literature. I don't know. So, okay, so my response to you is that maybe some features of what we see in all of these treatises uh, in the Bhagavad Gita and in Charaka uh, are to do with things being written down just at this time, at the, during these centuries. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and one uh, last remark uh, concerning the binding to meditation. Uh, from a perspective, uh, now I'm, I'm uh, living in an ashram environment for more than 15 years. And uh, from my perspective, after this time, uh, it's more uh, uh, a binding uh, or uh, being ready to, to meditation. Yeah? It's uh, mm. more the, 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 the mind and the, the buddhi uh, uh, plays a bigger role than, than the asana. Asana mm. is... Uh, Secondary, from my point of view, yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't matter where uh, where you are and how you sit. It's more important to to have this meditative mind, yeah, to be to be in, in peace and harmony, and to be ready to uh, know what's going on and mm. and uh, ready to uh, yeah turn the mind inwards. So yes, my point of view. Uh, and I, I, I think I, yes. I mean, do you? Can I ask you something? Do you find that when you are sitting to meditate, that uh, your body becomes com more comfortable after you've, uh, after you've settled the mind, perhaps bound the mind, or begun to meditate? Yes, for some time. Uh, at, after some time, it's it becomes uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes, because I, I, I do it. Uh, we do it a half an hour in the morning. Yes. Yeah. I'm not uh, a meditator for hours and hours. Yeah. Because <laughs> because I have to teach here and yes, uh, of course. manage the the the, the center. So 
Yes. So it's it's just an interesting point about about um, whether we adjust our posture until it's perfect, and then we can meditate, or whether we sit to meditate and after a while the body settles down. Uh, you know what is what comes first in or in that, or maybe they happen at the same time. It's something that Philip and I discussed quite a lot when we were we were working together in Vienna and thinking hard about the history of asana. And in, in particular, the interpretation of what Patanjali says, uh, st- um, and then prayatna uh, shaitilya, anantya samapatti bhyam, that the uh, posture becomes steady and comfortable by the relaxation of effort and the meditative focus on infinitude. So it sounds as if Patanjali is saying that you get the mind right and the body will follow. (laughs) Yeah, I would say yes to to this. uh, Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, further uh, questions? Yes, Alexander, please. Thank you for a uh, fascinating talk. I just wanted to uh, follow up on my question about two paths. Mm. Um, is it possible from the reading of the text to establish a relative logic of these two pieces? Like to say that the Vritinivriti text, uh, no, Paravritinivriti piece belongs to the older layer of the text or vice versa? It's a very interesting question, and no, um, I, I, I have no sense of that at the moment. Um, the only, you know, there, there are people who, in digital humanities, you know, who do statistical studies of vocabulary and collocations and detailed, detailed work on 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 vocabulary, use of vocabulary. Uh, and and that kind of study might be able to to show that one passage was more similar to perhaps a late Upanishad and another passage was more similar to epic but I haven't nobody's done that yet it, it's something that uh, I'm very aware of when I'm reading the me- medical texts is that there are several registers so in the passage we we're, we're reading actually uh, some of the verses so there's all this description this is pravriti this is nivriti and then the author says I, I didn't share this with you but then the author says and there are some verses about this and then he gives these so it's all in prose but then he says there are verses and then he gives the verses which are the last few verses that I I shared with you the 14 15 16 17 and so on so the author or the whoever edited this text is themselves referring to some body of verses, but we don't know where they, they come from. Were they some separate treatise? Were they something that just floated around in the, in this, in the, the, the blogosphere? Uh, so, th- you know, you keep finding that there are, you know, that the voice changes. It's one person speaking, it's another person speaking, it's prose, it's verse. And all of this is unexplored, really. We don't know, and we especially don't know about the chronology of early and late. Sanskrit studies lacks a good historical dictionary. Most of us use the German dictionary of, of the famous uh, Petersburg Wörterbuch and uh, of Bertling and Roth, and uh, also Monia Williams's uh, dictionary of Sanskrit, which was published by OUP. And these, both of, both of them and some others, are absolutely superb dictionaries. And I think all of us who read Sanskrit use all of them many times every day. I certainly do. Um, there is an that none of them are like the Oxford English Dictionary, where you can see a word as it was used in the 16th century and as it was used in the 18th century and so forth. That has never been done. It's begun at the at, at the Deccan College in Pune, where there is a, 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 a historical dictionary uh, of, of Sanskrit that has been being prepared for oh, at least 50 years, I think. 40 years, I can't remember, somebody will tell me, a long time, they still are on the first letter of the alphabet. So 
if you did some calculations, it's probably going to be ready in about 2,000 years. <laughs> so, you know, until we have a good historical dictionary of Sanskrit, um, it, you know, we're, we're always floundering a little bit with these historical questions. Maybe just a brief remark on what you mentioned, Dominic, namely uh, the attempt to uh, date uh, texts uh, by means of computational uh, calculation. And, uh, something like this was actually done by Oliver Helwig uh, for the Bhagavad Gita, and we, we mm. talked about this. Uh, and uh, Oliver came to the result that the Bhagavad Gita may be, uh, uh, no, definitely belongs to the uh, younger parts of the Mahabharata, And he would date the most uh, part of the Bhagavad Gita to sometime around 300 of the Common Era. So it would even be slightly younger than uh, the Charaka Sanita. So mm, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah. But, yeah, just, just as a, a, a follow up. Um, Thanks. No, that's very, very helpful. So are there uh, any further questions? If this is not the case, I would uh, once again uh, thank you very much for your uh, very uh, inspiring and uh, enriching uh, presentation to, to our conference, uh, Dominic. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for being you. with us. Uh, we have now uh, another uh, hour of uh, break, an early uh, evening break, and then we uh, meet again at uh, seven o'clock for a panel discussion where we can uh, discuss uh, all the questions uh, that have come up uh, after the presentation. So uh, if uh, you uh, thought about something uh, overnight that you heard yesterday uh, or um, yeah, in the course of the day uh, uh, with regard to earlier presentations, that's the right time uh, to come up with uh, these questions at seven uh, o'clock. So see you there and uh, thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>